Welcome to Jazz Zone Together, our new online jazz community where we'll provide jazz education and classroom resources, interviews with jazz educators, artists, and celebrities, along with valuable teaching tips and repertoire suggestions. Today, we're real pleased to welcome award-winning saxophonist, jazz educator, big band leader, and composer-arranger Bob Mincer. Bob has been saxophonist with the Yellow Jackets for over 30 years and has recorded with many leading jazz artists. He's had an incredible career on all levels. Now I'll turn the mic over to Dick Dunscombe to conduct the interview with Bob. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Appreciate that. And this is such a pleasure. Welcome, Bob Mincer. Thank you, Dick and Bob. Happy to be with you. Well, I couldn't imagine doing Jazz Zone together without the great Bob Mincer online. So uh, once again, it's such a pleasure to be with you. And we usually start the interviews by asking the guests to talk a little bit about uh, where it all started. So mm -hmm. maybe you could give us a little bit of a timeline about your history, how you got into music and a little yeah. bit of that. Yeah, well, I, I, I think my brain was wired in, in a particular way where I just, I wound up paying uh, very keen attention to any music I heard, be it on television, radio, in the supermarket, in an elevator, uh, on a recording device, or whatever it was. Uh, something really attracted me to the sound of music and, and made me want to know more about it essentially. And, and um, so uh, that in conjunction with the fact that I really had this keen interest in playing any in instrument I could get my hand on, really went together nicely. And I, I wound up, you know, there was a piano in the house where I grew up, I would spend hours just banging on the piano and trying to learn songs by ear. I had some friends that played guitars, and I wind up over at their place and we all taught ourselves how to play the guitar. Um, so there was a lot of music activity from, the, from very early on. And then, you know, there, uh, in terms of school music programs, uh, I actually, you know, they passed out those little index cards and you were supposed to write down what instrument you uh, wanted to play. And I wrote down guitar, <laughs> which of course, <laughs> we know is not, not, a, not a concert band instrument. Uh, so the guy went guitar, eh? I crossed that out and put clarinet. We, got, we have an overabundance of clarinet, so we're gonna give you one of those. And like any other instrument that came my way, I learned how to play it. I figured out how to play it. I took some, some lessons as well. And, uh, and so it went, you know, I played in school bands. Uh, uh, eventually started in, in middle school playing in these little rock and roll garage bands. Uh, I was playing, you know, in band and orchestra, but also the jazz band as it were. Um, and uh, the, the, the real turning point, I think, where I stepped up my game considerably was my senior year of high school, where I had the opportunity to go to the Interlock and Arts Academy out in Michigan hmm. and spent a year there learning the craft, learning, you know, what sort of time commitment would be involved to really, you know, be, be a, a, an effective artist and, and rubbing shoulders with, with you know, uh, like-minded people. Uh, Peter Erskine was actually a student there and we started a, what's become a 50 year relationship uh, virtually everybody and anybody that went there wound up either in a major symphony orchestra or, uh, you know, uh, Tom Wolk uh, played Mozart in the movie Amadeus. He was a student there, you know, so it was, it was very, a very creative, fertile environment and really inspiring to me. And I was, I was thrilled just to, you know, be playing music all the time. So, you know, I went to music conservatory for four years. After that, I went to Hart College of Music in Hartford. I was a clarinet major from those four years, uh, classical clarinet. Um, but, you know, on the side, I would go home and put on jazz records and teach myself how to play jazz and as much as possible, go out and sit in 
play with people. And uh, that's what I did, you know. So I, I think what, what was uh, really important about my training that really set me up for a, a very active uh, professional career was I learned how to, how to read music effectively. I learned how to play in ensembles effectively, you know, how to play in a section. Um, I learned about all different kinds of music, which made me fairly broad minded in my scope. And, uh, and I learned how to practice. I learned how to prepare for, uh, you know, playing situations. So when I got out of school, the phone started ringing and, uh, you know, uh, it, 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 it never stopped really. I mean, that was almost 50 years ago. Um, I, you know, my first, my first job actually came from a contact at Manhattan School of Music. Um, a, a classmate of mine got called to work with a guy named Ymir Diodato, who had a hit record on CTI label back then. He took the Strauss, Zarathustra, where was I? So anyway, this guy couldn't, didn't want to play with Diodato and he referred me to this contractor. And so I got in this band and then, you know, met 10 guys in the band and um, that they then had some indication of what my abilities were. And that led to other situations. There was a guitar player in the band named John Trope. He made a record. Uh, he recorded one of my songs. It sold a half a million copies. I got to play on the record. That music was used as background music for uh, sports events for years to come. So it just, you know, it sort of started to really spread through just the word of mouth scenario that one encounters in the music scene. Um, while I was touring with Diodato, I was also playing in the Tito Puente Orchestra in New York City. And that was great. That was a full-time gig, uh, seven nights a week and, you know, playing with a really hot Latin band. And the way that happened was I was playing in some, some lesser bands and, you know, frequently in the salsa scene, there'd be three, four, five bands playing on any given night in the joint. And uh, we played somewhere, one of the bigger uh, dance halls opposite Tito Puente's band. And, you know, they were sharp, you know, they had these nice sport coats on. And I was like, man, and they sounded great. And it was like, I wanted to play with them. And lo and behold, you know, I think, you know, just through that contact and them hearing me, whatever, word of mouth, they, I got a call to replace Sal Nistico in that band. And so, and so before good. before we go too much further into this, I know you also played with Buddy Rich, Thad Jones. That's Mel coming. Lewis, That's and, next. <laughs> and that that uh, yeah. scenario we really want to hear about. Yeah, well, it's coming. That, that was the next step. Uh, so you know, that was 1974. I played with Tito for a year, toured intermittently with Diodato. Started doing some session work around New York. Uh, and then I got a call to join the Buddy Rich Band. Now you have to remember that these Latin gigs didn't pay a lot of money. I think that Tito's gig paid $25 per, per mm -hmm. four hour engagement or whatever, whether it was an hour, four hours. Uh, and they took tax out. <laughs> so yeah, I think my take home check was a hundred bucks a week. Mm -hmm. But I was thrilled to just be playing. And then I got a call to join the Buddy Rich Band, which paid $300 a week. And I figured, um, I'm in. This is great. So actually, Roger Rosenberg and I were on the Tito Puente Orchestra. So we moved over to Buddy's Band. And uh, I'll never forget the first rehearsal. It was, uh, it was a rage fest. Buddy was, you know, just very uncomfortable. He didn't didn't know anybody really in the band. He had a whole new big band. He had just spent the last year with a small group and now he was reforming a big band. And I don't know, you know, it was just his craziness, whatever. He, he wanted to set the tone. So he was just, he was in a bad mood and was sort of screaming at everybody and counted, you know, called, uh, we had a rehearsal. He called like all the up-tempo tunes as fast as humanly possible. <laughs> And everybody's, you know, buried in the parts. And, you know, it was interesting. I mean, Roger and I were two of the younger guys in the band. And, you know, we were just sort of like shaking in our boots, like, oh, my God, you know, we should have stayed on Tito's band. 
and the older guys were like, man, I knew I shouldn't have taken this gig. I knew it, you know? So it was, it was sort of this confluence of different approaches. Uh, but that said, uh, you know, uh, it, things progressed and I spent two and a half years on and off playing in that band. It was a great opportunity to get to play every night, to travel the world. And uh, ultimately I started writing for the band, which I had never done before. So, I mean, to, to write my, you know, write virgin big band arrangements for, for that band was quite something. And I, I learned an awful lot. And, you know, just the way the scene works, just the word of mouth thing was in progress. You know, there's this guy, Bob Mincer, he's on the Buddy Rich Band, he plays good, he also writes and the word starts to spread and that's how it happens, right? So from there, I went to the Thad Jones, Mel Lewis Big Band and played some with Louis Bellison with Gil Evans, session work in New York, started doing Broadway shows, uh, you know, playing, writing. I wrote a, a, a LP for the Mel Lewis Jazz Orchestra of Herbie Hancock tunes. Uh, played in the Sam Jones, Tom Harrell big band, worked with Joe Chambers, Ray Mantia, did a tour, a couple of tours with Hubert Laws as a utility reed player, um, started playing on records, television commercials, all of that stuff. Um, and well, let's see, I mean, I mean, I could go on, this, this is a long, <laughs> a long <laughs> spiel. Well, I have a long is- career. This is beautiful, Bob. And uh, this, is, this is the kind of thing that our listeners really enjoy hearing. Yeah. So I mean, while we're talking about big bands, let's yeah. talk about the Bob Benzer big band. Well, that's coming. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, one thing leads to another, right? So, um, so it, 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 in there, uh, uh, let me see now. What was the trajectory? All right. So, it, uh, left buddy seventy seven, Thad and Mel. 78, Mel, 79 into 80. 81, I played with Jaco Pastorius for two years, 81 and 82. He had a big band as well, but and also a small group. I did some arranging for that. That was kind of interesting. Uh, so 83, there was a club in New York called the 7th Avenue South that the Brecker brothers were partners in uh, with some other folks. And it wound up being a great, great place to play for, uh, for you know, young uh, sort of broad-minded musicians. Um, most of the clubs in New York at that time, AKA Village Vanguard, uh, Sweet Basil, uh, what else was there? Uh, Village Gate, Fat Tuesdays, had proprietors that were very specific about the, what they thought jazz was and they would book accordingly. Whereas the Seventh Avenue South was kind of wide open, there were you know you could go in there and play anything with anybody, and it was just it was really all about the music, and they were going to have a Christmas party. I had been playing there with a small group, and uh, this the manager called them and said, "We're having a Christmas party. It might be fun if you put a big band together of like all the various musicians that play in the club," and I. At, actually, at that point, I wasn't crazy about the idea. I had played in several big bands. I really wanted to play small group at that point. But I agreed and just on a lark called every famous musician I knew in New York, which included Dave Sanborn, Mike and Randy Brecker, Lou Soloff, Marvin Stam, Peter Erskine, Will Lee, Don Grolnick, and on and on and on. And to my surprise, they all said, wow, that sounds like fun. And all agreed to do this. So now what? I, I, you know, quickly wrote a couple of big band arrangements and gathered together things I've written for Buddy and for Mel and uh, one thing and another. And we went in there and played. And of course, when you have a band full of hot shots like this was, uh, there were lines around the block and this thing just exploded. And uh, well, now I have a big band, like it or not. And I figured, well, this is here. It's happening, I might as well pursue this. And shortly thereafter, a fellow named Tom Jung wandered into the club. He had heard about us and he was starting a compact disc label, one of the first compact disc companies called Digital Music Products. And he uh, correctly uh, decided to record this band. It was just, you know, it was such great musicians 
and it really lent itself well to this whole high-end audiophile scene. And uh, we did this these a series of recordings actually over a 20 some odd year period. I think I did 12 CDs for that company. And uh, the, the first several uh, were recorded kind of like the old days uh, where there was minimal miking. We would get around one bi-directional microphone in a circle, all the horn players. And it, it made for a really, really full, a, a beautiful sound, you know, like an acoustic blend as opposed to an electronic blend where every instrument is individually mic'd. And so that started a whole scene, you know, there, uh, uh, with the help of the high-end audiophile crowd, these CDs started to take off, which provided opportunities to then publish some of the music, all the schools started playing the, the, the music. There's big bands all over the world that started calling me to come as a soloist. So, you know, one thing leads to another and, uh, and that's, that all started to happen. So all through the eighties, I was kind of doing that, but also doing Broadway, doing a lot of studio work now, um, subbing in the New York Philharmonic, doing some, you know, freelance classical work that required doubling in, in New York. And I was happy, I was doing what I always wanted to do. 1990 was another big pivotal point I joined a band called the Yellow Jackets and uh, that that was a really interesting experience it was it's a partnership band that is in existence to this day there's no leader and everyone is welcome to participate as a composer arranger producer decision maker and so that was happening um, is happening um, I taught at Manhattan School of Music for a couple of decades. And then I got an offer to move out to LA uh, to take an endowed chair professorship at the University of Southern California Thornton School of Music. Nine, 2008 actually is when I got out here. So that was another turning point. Um, a lot of my colleagues are out here. Peter Erskine is on the faculty, uh, Vince Mendoza, Russ Ferrante, uh, Bob Shepard, you know, guys that I've been associating with over the years. So it, it felt, it feels comfortable and it's just, it's a real creative environment. It's, it's a nice situation. Um, and then uh, uh, the next kind of big move if it, uh, was around 2016, I was asked to become the chief conductor of the WDR big band in Cologne, Germany. So I've been doing that for the last six years. Um, and that's a wonderful situation. I get to get to write and arrange music or bring, uh, you know, a guest over to work with the band and do projects where, you know, it's there's a week to a, two weeks of uh, rehearsal recording time. In fact, I just I did a CD with the band that's uh, soon to be released called Soundscapes of my original music and and the Yellow Jackets did their last CD with the band as well called Jackets X XL. So it's it's a super comfortable, fertile environment over there. So um, I'm uh, busy, I've uh, been busy and I'm so grateful to have these opportunities. But, you know, uh, if you hang in there and persevere and work hard, do your homework, you know, be a reasonable human being, somebody that people like to work with, there's no reason why you can't do whatever it is you envision doing in the music scene. And that's been my experience. You know, I mean, people say, wow, you know, you're, you're so successful. It, you, you know, it's really hard to be successful in the music scene. And my answer is always the same. It's like, yeah, I heard that, but it's not been my experience. Uh, I, I mean, yeah, it, everything's hard, right? I mean, it's hard. It's hard to play well. It's hard to uh, to suss out a scene. I mean, you know, we all have challenges. I, I, man, one of my first sessions in in New York, you know, uh, I was with the A team, and you know, they they were like, "Who's this guy?" Nobody knew who I was, and there was some issue with uh, my microphone. It was it, it was I don't know what that. So the engineer said, "I'm having a little trouble hearing the saxophone player." The guy next to me says. I got my tenor in the car. I'll go out and get it. I could play his part, you know? And I just, I thought, oh man, welcome to New York, you know? <laughs> um, so, it, you know, it's, it wasn't a straight line, but again, 
if you have a vision and you're, you know, you're dedicated and you work hard and, and you show up early and you participate, all things are possible. Well, let me tell you, Bob, you are an absolute icon for the field of jazz music. Let's, let's now focus a little bit on your um, work with students, because I know, yes, you, you're in the program at USC, but you also see people through your guest uh, soloing and conducting across the country and abroad. Mm -hmm. what, what's happening uh, or should be happening in the world of jazz education today? Well, it's, it's, it's uh, blossomed, uh, especially compared to when I was in school. I mean, there, you know, there were a couple of large comprehensive jazz programs in universities and a lot of smaller ones. I mean, the two schools I went to, Hart College of Music and Manhattan School of Music, the jazz programs were relatively small. And uh, the, I guess the difference was back then, we learned how to play on the bandstand. We, you know, we played in bands and, uh, you know, in my case and, and several of my colleagues' cases, studied classical music at university and then went out and played jazz elsewhere. But now, you know, the, there's, you know, the, there are jazz degrees offered everywhere, doctoral jazz degrees. And uh, it seems as if a lot of the training has sort of shifted to the university setting. Um, and that in conjunction with the fact that there's, you know, the internet exists and that this information is so readily available. I mean, you could go on YouTube and call up virtually any any performance of any artist. Uh, it, 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 it gives access to young players to this wealth of information, you know, which which can be overwhelming. It, it, it can be misconstrued, but it also can be a huge asset. I mean, if you're the kind of person that's organized and works hard, just to have that uh, information at your disposal really goes a long way. And, and we're hearing some really fantastic players come out of educational, you know, in, environments. So it's different. I mean, it's always, it's always going to be different from generation to generation, but uh, jazz is alive and well from what I can see. You know, I'm really happy to hear you say that because I, I believe that. I think that, that it's healthier today than it has been, uh, you know, many, many years. And, and a lot of it is due to the amount of jazz education that's going on in the schools. You know, we're not creating a lot of additional jazz players, but we're certainly creating a lot of consumers. And that's, mm -hmm. that's so important yeah. for, for the future of jazz. Yeah. Now, you, you've also uh, written some books for jazz saxophone. And uh, talk a little bit about that. Uh, I, I wrote a series of etude books. Um, that are really for any instrument. Uh, there, there's five versions of each. There's a trumpet version, a B flat version for soprano, clarinet, and tenor, E flat version, alto and baritone, concert for guitar, flute, piano, and a bass clef version for uh, trombone and bass. And the way these books came about was, uh, you know, in my travels, I just I found that I had a lot of free time sitting on airplanes and it was kind of fun and interesting to just free associate musically. I might like just write a page of written material that, that you know, might be something somebody would enjoy or I would enjoy playing like almost as an etude. And um, so I started working on these and in my travels, which is sort of share with people, you know, I'm, I just started writing these things out and people would sort of uh, in, enhance the concept by saying, wow, that's that's really cool. You know, you might think about doing thus and so. I, I, I ran into George Benson somewhere and he said, well, why don't you have a little play along CD that, you know, you could play the etude with, you know, and somebody else uh, made the suggestion, why don't you, you know, just have a little page of explanation as to some of the little devices that you use or, how, you know, what to do with an etude. I mean, yes, you learn how to play it, but then like any transcription exercise, you extract certain parts of it and you make it your own by just manipulation, by 
playing in different keys, playing in different ways, you know, shuffling notes around, whatever the case may be. So this concept kind of grew and evolved and um, I put these books out and it, it, as it turned out, there, there was nothing quite like it on the market at that time. I'm sure there's a lot like it now, but uh, you know, that at, uh, this is, when was this in the early nineties? You know, there were the Jamie Abersall books where you played along to a recording. It was the chord changes. And then there were transcription books where it was, you know, solos of so-and-so and you learn the transcription. So basically what I did was combine the two in a way where, you know, there, there was a playing opportunity, a theoretical opportunity and a vocabulary opportunity and a listening opportunity because I would do a version with me playing the etude. And I got great players, you know, to play on these things. So it was kind of a fun thing for people to, to play along with, you know, uh, aspiring players as well as professional players. So the books have done quite well over time. Um, well, in addition to that, uh, you, you've also written so many charts that are playable by uh, school groups throughout the country. And... Yeah. Um, your compositions are really beautiful, Bob. Talk a little bit, of, if you will, about how, how that came about and what's your process and maybe even what recommendations you might have for an aspiring young composer. Uh, I've, always, I've always tried to be a composer and arranger. I mean, it, it sort of went hand in hand with learning how to play. Uh, you, know, I, you know, if you're learning other people's songs, you're developing some level of vocabulary for a potential song of your own. Um, you know, we, uh, what is that saying? You know, average composers borrow, great composers steal. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I, you know, it's true. I, I, I mean, the key ingredient is, is to, to, you know, to do enough of that where you obscure where the, you know, the, the, uh, influence is coming from, or you, you know, you take your influence by something and you, you don't copy it verbatim, but you take some essence of it and rearrange things and turn it into something else. So, I mean, that's always been a part of my activity. Um, and, and furthermore, when I started playing in bands, it was a great vehicle for introducing my playing into a playing situation vis-a-vis uh, you know, a, a compositional environment. So I, when I joined, uh, well, this is a great st story. When I joined the Buddy Rich Band, I was the fourth tenor player and I got one solo a night on West Side Story. I, I, I wanted to kill myself because it was a written out 16 bar solo. Or so. It was just, it just didn't feel good to play. So when I started writing, I thought, you know what? I could write myself a solo. So, uh, <laughs> And that's what I did on every chart, you know, I wrote for Buddy, uh, you know, there were five or six of them before I left. And so, uh, you know, after writing these charts and Buddy loved playing them, uh, lo and behold, now I'm soloing a lot more and soloing in a way that's, you know, that I set up, you know, because I wrote the, the, the solo section with, you know, a, a harmonic structure that I'm comfortable with. And in a way too that, would allow me to play with Buddy in a way that I thought he would like and I would feel comfortable doing. So, you know, composition is like a really important tool. And we at USC, we stress composing and arranging from day one. I teach a freshman course called Jazz Elements. And um, yeah, we, you know, students start writing immediately. You know, we start with contrafacts, like taking a a standard and writing a new melody, uh, doing a, you know, writing a blues, rhythm changes, um, original music, uh, arrangements of standards, um, all of that uh, is so critical. I mean, you know, on so many different levels, it's, it's an integral part of any musicians, uh, you know, particularly jazz musicians. It's the vehicle for their playing that kind of sets, sets the stage for how they want to play and present their playing. So this has been such a fabulous interview. I mean, you have really not only shared your life story, but that of how to 
achieve these things that you've come to. So uh, before we close the interview, Bob, would it be possible for us to hear you play a little bit? Uh, that's going to cost you, you know. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, just so happened to have a saxophone over there. <laughs> so so okay. one, of the, one yeah. of the fun things, one of the things I really like to do is with, I mean, there's a bunch of things I like to do. You know, it's fun to do an arrangement of a standard or, or uh, but, but it's fun to just free associate and try to have no agenda, just wipe the slate clean and just play a note and then another note, which might conceivably suggest what the third note and onward is gonna be. And that's what I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna start. <laughs> That squeak was not part of it. been a fabulous time to be with you today. Wonderful having you here. You've been an icon and an inspiration to me throughout the years, and I know many, many other people as well. So your words today really help to inform the jazz aficionado, the musicians, the educators, and I can only say once again, thank you, Bob. Thank you, Dick, and thanks, Bob, and uh... Man, jazz music is part of life, an important part of life. And you know, we need we need to support the arts and music and humanities. And and you know, uh, I, I'm just I feel blessed to have the opportunity to partake in this activity. So thank you for inviting me. You bet. Thank you so much, Bob, for being a yeah. part of this. To our viewers. Thank you for watching and for being a part of our Jazz Zone Together community. We hope you enjoyed the interview with Bob and found it of real value.